Welcome to The Property Couch, where each week you get to listen to two of Australia's leading experts. Bryce Holdaway, co-host of Location, Location, Location Australia on Foxtel's Lifestyle Channel, co-host of Escape from the City on the ABC and partner of Empower Wealth Advisory. Ben Kingsley, Chair of Property Investors Council of Australia and the founder of Empower Wealth Advisory, named the 2018 and 2019 Property Advisory Firm of the Year. Stay tuned as they bring you the Insider's Guide to Property, Finance and Money Management. All right, folks, welcome back to the Property Couch Podcast. Welcome back to you too. Also, mate, how are you? G'day, mate. How are you going? I'm great, as usual. Favourite part of the week. Yeah. No, know what I found interesting? We had this little bit of preamble before we hit record, right? And then right. I was giving you a little couple of little um, cheap ones in the ribs about Collingwood. And then you're like... because. You know, the boards are rabble, there's teams are like, it's just deplorable. But you like, folks, this is what he said, bring it on, I've got ammo. So, <laughs> so, so I'm interested to know how, come on, well, let us know what, you, what let, your feedback let, is. Let, let's just acknowledge the fact that anything <laughs> to do with Collingwood sells papers or gets eyeballs, right? And sells advertising revenue. I'll, so, I'll, I'll acknowledge that, yes. So, so the reality is, is that anything that happens with the biggest club in the land gets blown out of proportion. Now the fact that you Blown have out of proportion, you got you got someone on your board who didn't even uh, work out your constitution has to be there for minimum two years, which she isn't. So therefore, they go, oh, that's okay. She's just not a voting member. Yeah. <laughs> not a voting member. <laughs> Would you have them on the board if they can't vote? <laughs> well, that's part of the constitution, right? And it obviously has been formed. You, you've got to remember that Collingwood has imploded a couple of times over over the journey, right? We, we think about the nineteen eighty and 81 grand finals where we got towed up. Um, and so oh, we, don't, know, we, don't need, we, yeah. we don't need to go through point, your... Point your being is stability is important no matter whether it's what organisation you're in. And we've had a lot of stability with Ed. And so now it's an opportunity to create an instability to blow the story up more than it's worth. <laughs> and there is definitely some resettling in in terms of the right people in the right seats on the bus. But it doesn't need to be exacerbated by the media it's a bit can, can i can oh, i put a right. reference can, into hang it? on mate i didn't bring the tissues sorry i, I didn't realize <laughs> we're going here so come on come but, on the, the other example is around you know some of the media hype around the vaccines right it's like first of all we don't have them now we've got them and so it's 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 everyone it's the government's responsibility to get oh. them now it's the government's responsibility to get them into people's arms Hey, I like what you did there. It's everyone's re- deflection. Did everyone everyone's see that? responsibility. Here's a, here's a simple way to get a responsibility is go and get a jab. Mm. If, if you're eligible to get a jab, go and get it. Mm. Because what's going to happen is I'm, when I'm we not get going down that path because there's, there's, there's too many people on opposite ends of the camp on that one. But um, uh, uh, the point is, Ben, here's yes, the call. What's here's that? the call. Because I saw what you did there. I saw you quickly just take it to another controversial topic just so that we weren't onto your, your controversial topic. But That's Fremantle how the media will win. Creates, the, cre- creates the agenda and it shouldn't be that way. Fremantle all- will win their next flag before you win your next one. Ooh. There you go. Oh, so, okay. There we go. It's on <laughs> record. I'm happy, I'm happy to accept that challenge. Okay, Bucks and the boys, there's the challenge for Bucks you. Bucks won't be around for the next one. So, <laughs> mate, pick a webinar you got coming up next week. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, next Tuesday night, uh, we've got Brad Beer, who's on the national board, active property investor and a specialist in depreciation. Mm-hmm. Um, he's going to just talk about the benefits and the cash cash flow benefits you get out of that. And there's a lot of um, misnomers and, you know, since the federal government changed the rules a couple of years ago. So we're just going to set the record straight um, and talk a little bit about some tax tips uh, coming into uh, the end of the financial year. So uh, get along to that, but you can Brad is the best in the business. He is the best in the business. Friend of the property couch, and they are the best in the business. So the right. invites will be going out to our members uh, very, very shortly for next Tuesday night's uh, webinar. You can only join if you're a member. Five dollars to join, or twenty. Get on it, folks. For five years. If you're not, if you're not available next week, if you're a member, you can watch it on demand after That's true. the event. So beautiful. Um, there you go. Hey, my mindset minute theme today comes from a, a, a person whose name is uh, difficult to pronounce, Ben. So here we go. Moko Koma, Moko Noana. Did you catch that? Yeah. Moko Koma, Moko Hoana. And this is the quote. Some of the people who are showing off their speed 
are heading in the right direction. Uh, sorry. <laughs> try trying, again. Are heading in the wrong, wrong direction. Direction, right? So I'm thinking about this and I'm going, how, do this, how does this relate to property investors? And I think it's really clear. Sometimes the, the oh, I see a lot of people go, hey, I've got 10 properties. And I go, okay, am I meant to be impressed? Well, I've got 10. It's like, well, I'd actually be more impressed if you tell me where they are and if they've actually <laughs> performed. Because I've got a, um, I've got someone that I'm working with now who's got a significant number of properties who, uh, unfortunately, those properties were that person running in the wrong direction. So it's actually causing a bit of a challenge with the bank. It's causing a bit of challenge with um, pivoting. And it's causing a bit of challenge on actually getting the big rock in the jar that's important, but then also getting back on track. So I just wanted that to land and ponder with our community, Ben, because um, I've said this one before, don't confuse activity with accomplishment. If you are showing off your speed in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter if you've got 10 properties because someone who's got three might be having a better portfolio performance than you yep. and may reach the top of the mountain quicker than you. So um, um, ponder that from Moco Coma, Moco Noana. There you go. Mm, Sounds like that's a beauty, beauty, doesn't it? So, like one. <laughs> there you go. All right. Today, we are going to talk about two things, Ben. We're going to do a budget review and we're yes. also got um, some Q&A uh, queued up. Yep. Um, for us to riff through as well. But um, yep, budget last week. We hinted at the episode last week. We obviously had Phil Slade on, which uh, received some fabulous feedback around Ben. Uh, if you haven't listened to that, can I encourage you to make sure after you've listened to today's episode that you do, because there is a piece of gold within that episode that will help you make better life choices around mm. managing your emotions. So you need to be across that. It's really, really important because we say money is simple, behavior is hard. If the behavior is the stuff that we need to focus on last week's episode, it's going to help you with that. But this week's episode is budget review, Ben. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll just get into uh, some of the bigger ticket items. We'll rip through those and then we'll talk to the property story mm. and what's relevant to property and property investors. Um, look, some of the, you know, sort of 30,000 foot view items. Wow. Politicians know how to spend money, don't they, Bryce? I mean, <laughs> my goodness, they know how to spend money. Yeah. So, so that's that's the big takeaway here. Obviously, this is a budget where it is really there's no tough decisions that are being made in this budget. We are not pressing slow down. We're not saying austerity measures. We're not trying to balance the books. Uh, we are still in a pandemic. We've got to be mindful of that. There are places around the world that are suffering terribly. Um, we are very, very fortunate. We're in the best economic position out of most developed countries. So um, that is also a good news story. So I, I look at this and sort of on one side of it, I do say if this was the family budget or if we were running a business like this, mm. um, we'd be thrown out of the boardroom mm. um, because, you know, basically we're going into further debt. Um, we're not even sort of making enough money to cover the debt. We need to borrow more. So we're sort of in this interest, capitalising interest type of arrangement. Mm. Um, just put it in uh, modern economic theory bucket bin. They'll sort yeah, that out. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so we have got some, you know, um, aged care, post royal commission. We've now basically a, a huge amount of money just needs to be thrown at that problem, mm. um, and and that won't let up now. So that that money is going to be needed every year, year on year, um, because of effectively, you know, you know, one would argue mismanagement and you know blame and and what have you. So. No one's showing up and doing what they said they were going to do. So that's problematic. All of this just, again, alludes to, you know, the, the issue I have with all politics, and that is that, you know, how we solve problems is throwing money at it. Um, you know, not too many tough decisions these days are made. But I get, I get if I then sort of put my fiscal and monetary policy hats on and I say, right, okay, monetary policy, um, fiscal policy. So the Reserve Board and Governor have been doing everything they can, and they've been encouraging um, you know, the, the monetary policy and the fiscal policy message. Um, and th the Liberals have delivered on that in terms of let's keep going hard. It's mm. all about jobs, jobs, jobs. Mm. Um, and that's what we're going after. And, and that will then obviously create the wage growth and the wage growth will create the inflation. And then in theory, if you grow your economy, you get bigger tax receipts. And that's what we saw um, in terms of the budget improvement. What was the what was the number in terms of... So we did... Remember, we had a delayed budget because the pandemic was in, so we had a, a late budget in, I think it was October from memory. Um, the, the numbers have improved significantly, Bryce, haven't they? Mm, $104 billion, um, increase or improvement from the last budget with... Um, the next four years spending 96 billion. So we pick up the coin. 
It, well, you know, we, we were in a better position by 104 billion than what was forecast. But so the government said, all right, well, let's go and throw 96 more billion at the problem hmm. um, to, to get that sort of uh, fiscal policy happening. And that's what they've done. So it is, it, it, you know, one would think that there has got to be an election in the air uh, somewhere here, bro. Yes, you know, now. Under promise, over deliver potential, as well as um, getting them ready, oh, geared yeah. up for a, um, a pre election budget um, next time around. ScoMo knows what he's doing. He's over promising and under deliver, you know, he's under under promising Oops. and over delivering. No, we're there not we talking go. about Collingwood, mate. We're talking <laughs> about the budget. So, yeah. And look, there's $10 billion worth of unannounced um, spending, right? So, that's that also says to us, look, he's hedging his bets on whether he's going to go early. Um, with an early election or go late and, you know, go after next year's budget. And that's all going to come down to how well the economy is going. I mean, one thing for me that, that, that you know, I'll, I'll talk about this because I'm a centralist. Um, I, you know, the best is being in the middle when it comes to politics. Mm -hmm. uh, I might be right leaning, you know, because I, I think um, open markets and economic activity drive um, the, 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 the tax revenues that you need. I, I'm not a big believer in basically just building massive social frameworks and social um, safety nets. I don't think that that bodes well for a, a thriving economy um, where you've got people challenging ourselves to be better. I Let's think pick up on a point you just said there, Ben, so that we can inform our communities. Who Some do know, some don't know, but leaning left means leaning towards Labor. Leaning yep. right means leaning towards uh, Liberal. So that's so why you're saying yeah, central so with a lean to the right is correct. central with a lean to, to, to the Liberal. Yeah, yeah. so it's a socialist approach where basically the government's expected to do a lot more mm -hmm. versus the let, the let the open market and let the government basically get out of your way. So the far right just says basically open market, let's, let's have minimal regulation, minimal. And I agree that that does not work. You know, you're basically too much greed gets in the system um, and, you know, so the, the balance and the best part is in the middle where you have a good safety net, mm. um, but you don't go over the top where you discourage people from actually um, getting off their bums and doing something and, and you know, making a contribution because you also have a situation where if they are too, you know, too rewarded for doing nothing, then the, the idle mind, you know, is the devil's playground and all of a sudden, you know, they've got other problems and other issues. So there's a big story there. We won't get too much into that, but you can see that that's that's where I sit. I think I, I, I'm, you've got to you've got to do the heavy lifting on those the most vulnerable in the community. Um, but there is an expectation, and I've said this: you should never, ever, ever rely on government mm. for your your overall happiness. And who's responsible? Ultimately, you should be responsible for your own destiny, and and that's the place that we we play, and that's what we're encouraging in our community that people are aspirational Australians who have, you know, this future orientation about making a better life for themselves. And that's who we talk to. Yeah. And you make a good point. We shouldn't rely on the government. And if you, if you look at the system, the system doesn't allow you to rely on the government because they have to make decisions that are not in the long-term interests of uh, all Australians and all the economy. They have to make decisions, strategic decisions, which is the nature of politics to make sure they stay in power. Correct. And therefore, if you, if you, do not bank that fundamental principle of, I mean, we just described it. Hey, look, leaving a bit in the till for next year so that they can spend it for the election. Like, if you don't understand the cycle of what's going on with government, well, mm. then you're just ignoring why the government's not there to look after you. You've got to be, I mean, hence the reason for our podcast is to self-fund your own uh, lifestyle design. So, all right, we um, there's some infrastructure spend coming, Ben. 15.2 billion. 15.2 billion, mainly on roads and terminals and and freight infrastructure and so forth. We won't go through all of that. It's very easy to Google. You can you can see it there. You know, good bit of money into Victoria for terminals. We've got upgrades and Western Highways and um, South Australia got the the bypass in. So really easy stuff to get through. Otherwise, we'll be we'll spend basically half a day and going through this. The cashback was was a good one in terms of the tax. Yeah, the tax offset was extended another year. And I think that's really great, again, for the low income earners where they mm. get up to $1,080. Um, so if you're learn, earning less than $120,000, um, then this tax offset is just a, a nice little kicker. Mm. Um, so come tax return time, um, you're going to be moving to the tax man quicker to get your little cashback. Uh, and whack that in the offset or in the savings account people um, to start building up that deposit if you need to. So it's been introduced a few years back and, and the government sort of thinks it's a nice little way to sort of say we've done really well 
Um, so, you know, there's, there's just another little kickback for you as well. On the childcare stuff, I think it's, it's important to note that, um, that there's, you know, obviously there was a lot of money promised for aged care and there's also some money in there for childcare in regards to that, you know, two or more children uh, and making sure you get, um, you know, that uh, uh, it's up to five, 30% of the maximum CCS rate to 95% of those children. So it basically just means that you've got a cap of $10,560 per child. And they're just sort of saying, it's very, very hard for, for families that have more children um, to be able to afford uh, childcare and work. And so there's a little bit extra on the table for those people who have two or more mm. children. Um, mm. So I think that's, that's, you know, that's the right balance. There's people out there who don't have children. And so, you know, childcare needs for them, they, they want their money potentially spent somewhere else. But I think from, from, a, from our point of view, a growing population, and uh, you know, a happy society has a, a great mix of new population, new kids coming through, and so I think that that's you know the right measure in terms mm. of continuing to work on childcare um, and putting some money in there. Property front, Ben. Yeah, the property. Hey, good news. So, good news. I think there's some. Well, yeah. Tell us about the good news, mate. I think this is a this is a good news story, right? There's, mate, mate there's, they haven't touched negative gearing or capital gains tax. <laughs> we talked about Brad Beer before, um, Ben. Can you remember a couple of years ago when uh, he was telling us he was sitting there he was having dinner uh, on budget <laughs> night and almost choked on his uh, on his uh, on his mouthful when he realized that they'd made a a pen stroke that affected his particular wheelhouse with yeah. depreciation but um good to, good to know that there wasn't any surprises yeah I, th I think you know they they called it sort of a, a balancing measure or whatever they called a you know certain you know marketing buzzword at the time that they used um, you know, sort of trying to make it a fairer system, but they they took away the ability to go and travel and claim that travel cost to look at your investment property in a state, which I thought was a bit rich. Mm. And then they also took away, and this is, we're talking about the Liberals here, um, they also took away the ability to write off uh, the future uh, depreciation allowance of fixtures and fittings inside mm. a property, which I thought, mm, that's a bit rich too, mm. um, considering that there would have, there is a better way of doing it. But again, it was all about effectively saving money or instead of paying money out uh, and collecting more tax receipts so good that good no change there in terms of labor we we're pretty sure they won't be silly enough to uh, bring the same policies to the third election and lose um, because uh, yes you'll understand that people's wealth is in their property and and um, if you haven't learned that already yet labor you will learn that now but it, it doesn't mean that they won't be playing on the edges around third or fourth investment property and, and reducing the amount of negative gearing you can do or um, you know tinkering with capital gains tax I suspect um, you know they've got a they announced in their budget reply a significant social housing um, scheme um, which they say is off budget so effectively it's going to be self-funding is what they're saying so uh, you know we welcome anything to do with helping those most in need yeah. um, but I do suspect that you know with the amount of you know again leaning left, the amount of spending that, that Labor likes to provide into the community says that they've got to find revenue somewhere. Um, and property investors in their mind are, have traditionally been an easier target um, to, you know, because they position us as these rich um, people. And we'll, we'll talk about the Victorian state government later because you'll, you'll wind me up there, Bryce. You'll yeah. wind me up there. Uh, I look forward Next to one. winding you up. Oh, this one's a good one, isn't it? The, uh, the family home guarantee for single parents. We'll talk about trying to... Um, capture marginalised people. This, this is fabulous. So there's a new family home guarantee that's been introduced. It'll allow up to 10,000 single parents to purchase a home with as little as 2% deposit over the next four years. So, and this scheme will come into effect from 1 July um, this year or 2021 and similar price cap system to the first home buyer scheme. So you obviously can't do it if you can get a $2 million house, but at some point there is an opportunity for people who... Uh, go through a stage of life where they're very financially, very vulnerable um, uh, in a difficult season of life um, that, uh, or for some, I might add, uh, not mm. for everyone, um, uh, that gives a leg up. It's fabulous. I look at, um, I reckon they've been listening to our podcast, Bryce, because we have been on about um, and, and high praise um, for the challenges around single uh, individuals or singles with children, mm. it is very, very difficult to to raise that deposit and get mm. into your home. So, so I think this is an excellent initiative, um, coupled with you know the high praise that we have for the Victorian Labor government 
um, down here around their equity share scheme, hmm. that they've also introduced that. That to me is the bee's knees. And I would be saying if any other politicians are listening to us or policy creators, if every state and territory had a similar type of equity share scheme to allow people, as well as this 2% piece here, I mean, obviously one or the other, giving those people choice, because this is only for 10,000 single parents. Now, the argument is, Treasury says there's about 120,000 of those potentially per annum. Yeah. So, so from that point of view, it's a starting point. But if you combine the option of those two initiatives, then that's only good for those for those people to get a roof over the head that they own and build an asset base because our, you know, they will get lost in the system over time if they're renting for the rest of their lives and they don't have enough super to look after them. They will be a burden on the taxpayer um, going forward. Now, when I use that word burden on the taxpayer, I'm not saying they're a burden on society. Please don't misinterpret that. But what we are just basically saying is it gives them another opportunity uh, to potentially get into the market. So we think that that's that's a good initiative and we'd like to see more of it. Bravo, tick there. Okay, the uh, first home super saver scheme in the past been part of the, uh, the system, but there's also a, uh, a an opportunity to allow it to go up to $50,000 in voluntary super contributions. So that was previously capped at 30,000. So it's basically allowing people to use the, 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 the tax framework that is super uh, to get yourself a deposit for your first home which essentially is a way of saying, well, after-tax dollars is easier to save in that environment than it is to save outside of that environment. Therefore, um, that's where the opportunity exists. So we've we've got an example, Ben, that, that we can we can run through. So yeah, so so explaining that. So effectively, super is a tax structure, and it, and traditionally it doesn't allow you to get your own money because you can't be trusted with your own money. That's that, that's part of you know, the government saying we can't we can't afford you in, in retirement, you, you're gonna to have to pay your own way. That's why there's a forced savings scheme called super. Now, what's happening here is it is not your compulsory contribution. So it's not your nine and a half percent, which moves to 10% next uh, on July one, it's nine and a half percent. That can't be touched. touched. This is additional contribution. Mm. So any additional contributions that you do make is taxed at 15% going in. So the example is this, if you're on 135,000 a year, your normal marginal tax rate would be 39%. So you'd be paying around 14,000 of your pre-tax in income. So that that's around- well, using the, So so using 14,000 of your pre-tax income? Yeah, your pre-tax income, which is, so of that 39%, which is $5,460. So that would, so that ultimately means that if that money was taken in tax, Mm. then $8,540 would, would be what would be hitting your savings account, right? Yeah. So, so that hits your savings account traditionally. Now, again, high interest savings accounts, very low, low interest rates, your money's not really working harder for you. Mm. So what if you could actually put that $14,000 contribution as an additional contribution into super? It means that the tax would move from $5,461 to down to $2,100 of tax. That means $11,900 would go into your super and you'd be earning returns on that $11,900. And then you can take up to 50,000 of that out for a deposit for a home. So I think it's, it's just another great option because we do know the barrier of entry rather than trying to solve the affordability problem and and you know, take the open market out of play. Yeah, deposit's saying, the biggest issue. Deposit's the biggest issue. So this is a again another way in which you could go and speak to your financial planner and or a tax accountant, and they can talk to you about the pros and cons of this. Um, we're not saying advice. We're just using statements of fact. Mm. Um, but it basically is definitely um, a, an advantage. And if you're certainly on a six-figure income, you'll get a higher advantage, right? Because obviously your marginal tax rate increases now. Next year, we're proposing that people earning up, or the Liberal Party, I should say, are proposing anyone who's earning up to $200,000 will have a 30% tax rate. So that's also, you know, that's potentially promised into the next year's budget. So it'd be interesting to see if the economy goes really, really well, we'll see that implemented. If the economy starts to stall, um, you know, at, at some point in time, they're going to have to pay back this debt. Um, so we'll see where that is. But this is a nice little incentive um, if you are thinking about two or three years of saving before you get your deposit for your home, 
this is a good way for your money to work harder for you and you're allowed access to that money as part of that, but not your compulsory contribution. Your compulsory. So this let's get that to land, Ben. Let's get yep. that to land. So of the last $14,000 that you earn in your own name, you would be paying tax uh, of 5,460 on that last 14,000, mm -hmm. which means that you would save 8,540. Contrast to putting that last $14,000 as a voluntary contribution super. So side by side, there's still 14,000. Yep. You, you would actually only be paying 2,100 in tax instead of the 5,460. So therefore you would be saving 11,9 versus the 8,540. So that's yep. the key. Correct. Saving 11,900 instead of the 8,540, which essentially is giving you um, almost a 40% increase on your savings as a result of just changing the taxation environment. Correct. But again, using what you've said, it's got to be the voluntary portion. Yeah, and, and my understanding is you can make a lump sum or you can just take it out of your pay every every time. So it's a, it's a bit like pay yourself first to the side. So you're not seeing it in your day-to-day -day, uh, or week-to-week -week pay slips coming through a fortnightly or monthly pay slip. So, it's well worth considering um, if you're a few years away from, from getting into that space and making your money work harder for you. And what is also worth considering is going and getting professional advice around that, Ben, mm. because uh, what we just said is not professional advice. It is just a, uh, an example for you to, um, to get, the, get the, uh, the, the idea ticking over so you can go and seek suitable advice for you. All right, the new home guarantee. Yeah, so the new home guarantee, which is linked to the 2% um, first home, uh, sorry, I've got to get the right terminology, the family home guarantee for single parents. So that's basically the one we were talking before. Now we've also got this new home guarantee. So it's not brand new. There's just an additional 10,000 places whereby you have, you bring 5% to the table and the government will guarantee the other 15%. So there's a saving in lender's mortgage insurance here, and there's ultimately um, a savings in terms of stamp duty and other things that you would be doing. So currently there's 27 lenders um, that will do this, will, that are signed up to this government program. Um, it's put through, you know, the government's National Housing Finance and Investment Corporation. So it's structured through this vehicle um, eligibility is for Australian citizens only, people over the age of 18 in a de facto or a marital relationship. So there's some conditions around that. It does get a little bit more complex because there's only 10,000 spots. And so there are different price points in terms of different marketplaces. So where property is more expensive, um, you can have a look at the thresholds in terms of, and it's got to be new it's not, it can't be existing property. So it's either got to be buying a brand new property that's been built, buying off the plan, buying house and land pay. And we could spend half a day in terms of all the terminology there. So what we've done is in the show notes, we've got a link to the two page fact sheet, mm. um, which can help nice. you in terms of what that looks like. But it's, yeah, look, it's a, another example of where the government's doing everything to assist first home buyers in getting into the market. And remember, if the government's giving away moolah, your job is to take advantage of that moolah because they're taking it back off us, right? Every chance they get, they've got to pay this debt back. They're going to, so, so please, whenever there's a handout, it's, it's on you to basically put your hand, to out. Put your hand out and take it. <laughs> um, so this is an example of that. I can, I can tell a story, Ben. One of my wife's uh, family has uh, taken up this, got their first home. Um, but it's just so, it's such a joy to see a couple who didn't think pre-COVID that they could do it. I've mentioned this before. Didn't think yeah. pre-COVID they could do it. Because of COVID, got on the savings um, bandwagon and then took advantage of this. And the spring in the step and the just the the positivity and the non-financial um, gains that are, I'm seeing in in this this um, part of Andrew's family is phenomenal, right? Mm. So it is it is exciting. So some some more people can get access to that. I think is is really really good. Um, all right, let's swing to public housing, Ben. Yeah, so um, effectively public housing is the responsibility of the state and territory governments, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it's normal that federal governments don't necessarily contribute huge amounts of money in this area. Um, remember, all GST receipts go to the states and territories, um, as well as you know their stamp duty receipts and the, the land tax and the payroll tax that they get off us. They, they take a good clip of states and territories. Anyway, um, so the, the federal government have announced $124 million worth of social housing 
and community housing. I think it's a good story. Um, they're they're going to be supporting more and more of those sectors to provide that. Homelessness is an issue. Mm. Um, you know, obviously mental health connected with homelessness and purpose and all those things. Mm. Um, we're seeing too many people fall through those cracks. So um, there's a little bit of money there. 124 million is not a huge amount of money, but um, that's supplementary to obviously the states and territories in terms of doing their work there. We did see uh, the Andrews Labor government down here um, announce one of the biggest social housing uh, packages of recent times um, to, to deliver more of that sort of social housing and, uh, and affordable housing. So I think you'll see more of this where we're trying to, again, uh, you know, look after the more vulnerable in the community. Uh, but from my point of view, um, you know, just do the best, show up, get educated, do whatever you can um, to, to keep moving forward. And hopefully you won't fall into any dangerous debt cycles and find yourself in this situation. So, um, but in some cases people do, um, domestic violence, all of those horrible things, uh, vulnerable people in the community. So it's good to see this, there's a safety net system there. So I think it's you know, all in all, um, it's a, it's not a bad policy. It's another it's another marginalised group of people that uh, are getting some benefit, which is which is really yep. great. So uh, well done for that. Hey, the next one's exciting, Ben. The um, the superannuation downsizer scheme. It was a it's an extension of um, a scheme that was introduced in the 2017 budget, which is essentially saying if you were at the time if you were 65 years or older, you could make a one off uh, contribution of three hundred thousand dollars to to your super. But mm. now there's two changes, specific changes. That age threshold has dropped by five. So the other thing is that you can then now do for a couple, you could actually contribute um, three hundred thousand each. Mm. So therefore, up to six hundred thousand. So not only is that a, a significant um, uh, impact for those people, but it also means that it helps with the turnover of stock because of mm. of the people that were in that that cycle of life where they were asset rich, cash flow poor, but it was going to be a challenge for them to to sell their house. Well, now there's an incentive for them to sell, put some money into a favorable tax environment, but also then downsize to a house that's more appropriate for them at the, at the cycle of life that they're in and also free up some homes, some larger homes for the next cycle of people that have got to come, next cycle of families that need larger homes with bigger backyards, with more bedrooms, um, to allow them to do that. So I think this is, I think this is a really good initiative. And um, dropping it by five years and allowing people to put up to six hundred per couple is really good. Ben, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it, but it also just highlights that this is, to me, this is actually good economic policy in the sense that 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 we've got to understand that in a free open market, which is what our economy and our living standards have all been built on, mm. make no mistake about that. Um, you know, it's why we're world leaders in biotech. It's, you know, it's all of these things. It's this competitive tension that allows us to show up and be the best version of ourselves. But when you do that and you become a wealthy nation, your property prices are a representation. Your land value is a representation of that. And those people who may have enjoyed continued improvement in their land value, this is a way in which they can convert that um, sale where they pay no capital gains mm. on their principal and they can inject that straight into super. 50%. And in pension phase, there's currently no tax in pension phase. So mm. it, is, it is the sweetest deal mm. uh, for those people who have not necessarily, and it's, a, it's, a, it's also... Um, a justification in the argument we've had f f from the day one we started this podcast is people aren't saving enough for retirement. Mm. You know, the fact that they have to do this just basically means that they haven't built up an asset base to do that, but it gives one of those uh, credentials. The, the other one, Bryce, is um, the reverse mortgage environment. So what the government's got is also a policy around potentially getting um, a portion of the value of your home out um, is either a lump sum and what they've also noted and tidied up in their budget papers this time around is you can never get into a negative equity position. So in the event that your property uh, or what the money that you've taken out um, is more than the value of the property when it's sold, um, there's no further commitment to pay uh, from those family members afterwards. So I think, again, another good sign to sort of say, mm. hey, how do we, how do we um, monetize without raising taxes let me let me say that again. Without raising taxes, how are we able to release the wealth 
that people have got in their properties. Now, a reverse mortgage is a classic example of people still staying where they want to live um, and enjoying their life until they pass um, and not, not and you know, utilizing cash so they can live comfortably um, is another example of sensible economic management um, that continues to see um, you know, the progress of society and the wealth in the society keep growing. Because the higher the wealth grows, the, the more people get lifted up. And if anyone wants to argue socialism over that, I will argue that point any day of the week because hmm. it doesn't work the other way around. So that one's, those two are, are, are excellent examples of no extra tax, nothing for us to pay. Let's just release some of the value that has been created. And that's why we like what's happening for first home buyers in terms of getting into their own homes, because that also means that they're building up an asset as opposed to being in a situation where um, if they stay renters for their entire life, um, they are going to require a pension uh, and not necessarily have good quality of life, good health cover, all those things that are important later in life. Yeah, what's good about the um, uh, the downsizer scheme too, Ben, is it serves it serves two masters, right? It's, it, it serves the individual very, very well, but it serves the it serves the market um, mm. requirement for supply yep. of housing, right? So it just, just gets that turnover happening, which is part of the reason why we're seeing some of the conditions that we've experienced at the first part of this year is the fact that um, the, the the no stock means no one's selling. So therefore no one's selling means that there, there's less stock, which means the prices are growing. So it just creates that fluidity mm. of turnover of housing, which I think will, will benefit the, the market and also benefits the individual. All right, let's round it out with Home Builder. The last one, the home builder, look, we, we've talked about this before, so we don't need to spend much time on it, but just a reminder that there has been an extension of when you can start. So you've got an 18 month extension of when you can start to build right there. It's definitely resulted in a huge pent up amount of demand for new starts of new construction. That's great for the economy. Um, it's great for tradies. It's great for the whole marketplace. And so all it's just doing is um, confirming as per previous Lee, that, um, that that extension now applies for 18 months for all applications. So that'll just smooth out the, the pent up demand in the market. So home builder hasn't been extended. It's just basically um, the time period in which you can start. So there's no new grants being issued, um, but that program has been quite successful um, post pandemic of getting the construction industry moving. Um, so it's, it's served its purpose uh, for that time being. Very good. All right. So the Victorian state budget, Ben, is today um yep. tim pellis tim pellis tim pellis has got a big yep. job to uh cover up a big black hole. well <laughs> yeah oh mate here we go right so <laughs> first of all he releases it on a saturday which is not a, a business working day because he knows it's a toxic policy yeah. um secondly so you know whether he it's because the, the state budget's today right and as we're recording it we don't know what he's whether he's backflipped on what he proposed um but the way in which he proposed it, Victoria is being poorly economically managed. I want to call it out for what it is, right? $23.3 billion black hole in our budget. And I can say this started right back when we, when we cut a check to a construction company for $1.3 billion for a bit of infrastructure we didn't get called the East West Link. So mm. I'm, I'm a big... That we um, need that. We oh, need that. Man, we do <laughs> need that every other tunnel except that one. It's just ridiculous. Anyway... Um, so, and that, that, that drives economic productivity. Why do you think we build infrastructure in the first place? It's because we, we get economic productivity out of it. We get efficiencies out of it. So that's, that was a political decision that, that um, lost me, Mr. Andrews. Um, and so I, I haven't been a big fan of that policy at all. Um, and obviously the COVID um, mismanagement has resulted in all of the additional spending that's going on. So, so we've got a $23.3 billion black hole. Now to put that into context, Bryce, Every other state and territory combined doesn't, doesn't cover that black hole. So that's mm. how poorly um, we're running our economy Oops. down here at the moment. <laughs> Oops. Um, so what, what do you think? You know, let's think, do, have they been creative? Like have they been, have they had some really interesting thinking about how they could design economic growth? Because we saw what happens when you, when you beat the health crisis and you open the economy back up. We, we get billions of dollars of additional tax flows coming in. That's, that's, that's how you run an economy. You build it. You don't necessarily tax it 
and keep that. Well, no, no, you just you just don't be creative at all. You just tax the rich. Oh, we just tax the rich. We'll talk to our base over here. The socialists will be happy there. Everyone, you know, with the people on the left, that's right. Those, those rich people, they, you know, they, they didn't work any harder than I did. Well, one could argue that comment. But anyway, the point I'm making here is stamp duty, land tax, they're going after it. And, hmm. and it's just, just lazy, lazy economic management. Hmm. There's no, there is nothing else to describe it. What what are you what are you giving to us, Tim? That's going to give us an economic boost. That's going to drive because because let's go through them, and I'll, I'll just I'll I'll just highlight to you what they do from an economic point of view in terms of um, the benefits to the economy longer term. So the first one, um, they're going to have a a, a tax hike, eighteen point two percent increase in stamp duty from 5.5% to 6.5% on property values over $2 million, mm. increasing the tax by about $20,000 for a $2 million property. That's number one. So stamp duty. So we already know stamp duty is a completely pathetic tax. It is a lazy tax. It is not constructive. It doesn't provide economic incentive at all to turn properties over, to have mobility, um, to get the economy moving. Because when you do turn things over, things happen. You've got delivery drivers, you know, they have to move removalists. Everything changes, right? You've got banks that refinance and that creates mortgage jobs. You've got utility providers who then pitch for your business. All of that creates economic movement um, and that creates jobs. Um, just whacking up stamp duty after he received several reports, um, you know, in terms of review of stamp duty, where they said you shouldn't do it. So Solar Select's come out and said, dumb, dumb, dumber, mm. right? Uh, on that one. So that's the first one. Then the second one, oh, you know, uh, well, th the economy's going pretty well down here. I, I disagree. Um, but in terms of 90% increase on land tax on properties valued between 1.8 million and 3 million, with a rate increase from 1.3 to 1.55%. Let's just put the land tax up, <laughs> right? Let's put the land tax up. So why, like, right? So, yeah, right, okay. So this is a, this is going to do what? What for you? How much? How much money is it going to bring in? Because mm. as the land tax goes up, what happens next, Bryce? What happens when people put land tax up? They pass it on. They pass it on. Mm. So, so here's so imagine all of these people who are small, medium-sized enterprises who've been smashed by COVID because we've had the worst uh, in, in infestation of COVID, or, or you know, um, the you know the the, the 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 locks down were the hardest here. These people in small business who have retail or offices and those type of things where people aren't necessarily moving around anymore, they are struggling, and and then all of a sudden now the landlords are going to pass on those, you know, those increases, or they're just going to get rid of the properties. Mm. It's like there is just no value in holding those particular assets. So, mm. it, oh, just, so, so I'm trying to work out how that provides long-term economic stimulus. Because I'll, I'll use another argument here, Bryce. Um, we we obviously pay a significant amount in the hundreds of thousands of dollars in payroll tax, which is the other most stupidest tax. Um, that I've ever seen introduced in, in, in um, domestic politics. Um, what, what it says to us is, if we want to employ another 50 or 100 people, or if I'm an international business and I'm coming down here, um, I want to I want to basically set up offices in one of the states or territories, and I'm going to employ one, two, 300 people. Uh, and I'm looking at your payroll tax, and then I'm looking at your, your land tax for your buildings. And I'm sitting there going, why would I? Why mm -hmm. would I choose Victoria over setting up in Queensland or mm -hmm. setting up in South Australia? Like, mm -hmm. what, 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 what's the incentive here that you're giving me? Now, what they do do, they then cut deals on the side, you know, and they cut these deals for these big multinationals that are promising to come in. And guess who pays for that? Well, that's you and me. That's the local people in the marketplace going, oh, that's good that they're creating more jobs, but they're getting a subsidy for doing that or a, or a five or a 10 year, you know, sort of um, exemption. To, no, just we, we've got this, Tim. Just let us do our thing. Let the open market do its thing. Give us less taxes and we'll grow the economy for you. 
right? We'll invest, we'll employ, and then you'll get out of your black hole for your mismanagement. Mm. I, I, I just find that staggering. Now, I think you should fire up, Ben. I, th I think you should fire up. I think you're, I think you're a bit subdued. Hey, in this article in the financial reviews, says Tim Pallas says the property sector is receiving about 2.6 billion in other government support and can afford to give something back. And it's talk, and then talks here. We're seeing property prices increase by 8.6 percent between October 2020 and April 21. So it's clearly saying, well. That's a well that can afford it. So it's time to well, get it back. This is where I get the least political damage. And I've said this before, that they are coming after property investors. They are coming after landholders. They are coming up because that's, that's, that's their go-to. That's politically less sensitive to their base. Um, but in reality, what they're doing is they're bringing us back into, and I, I only need to bring one period of economic, all I need to say is 1980s under the Labor government here in Victoria, Joan Kerner. I mean, we were in economic freefall because mm. of poor economic management and there was no solutions, there was no creativity, there was no opportunity here. Um, and then we needed to reboot the entire economy, which takes, you know, a, about a decade to do that. Um, and so there's two big crosses, right? Stamp duty and land tax, lazy politics, lazy economic thinking um, and, and basically just a cash grab. Mm. Now, here's where I'm, I've got a half tick and a half cross. The final one there about around that pro property developers, Bryce. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's an interesting diagram. It doesn't quite work, but yeah, let's talk about what's happening with property developers. Yeah, well, so <clears throat> if, a, if, if you're in a situation where you've received a windfall, this is the proposal, if you've received a windfall in excess of $500,000, um, there will be a tax of up to 50% on that. So what does that mean? Someone who owns a big parcel of land, for example, who's lived there for, for an extensive period of time, and then as a result of a pen stroke, the zoning means that, that your land is now highest and best use at a significantly higher value. Um, what they're saying is it's nothing um, as a result of what you've done. It's a result of the pen stroke that they've done. So therefore, they're going to take... Um, their portion of that so that they can actually um, contribute that back to the infrastructure. So, you know, for, for, for the majority of people, Ben, that doesn't affect them, but for the, for the people that it does affect, they will, uh, this will come as a surprise, but they will, they will shuffle in their seat and get comfortable and find a way to actually still make it profitable for them and also pass it on to the end consumer. So, so part of me says, I, I get that, that through just a simple rezoning of, of best use, as you say, turning rural land into resi land, there is a significant windfall for that landowner. Um, and so I get why there's, there's probably an argument that you could take a bit off the table there, but I can also see how those developers um, will respond and how they're going to respond is they're just basically going to um, squeeze supply and they'll squeeze supply um, until such time, because I say as you develop it, remember that that they're not going to get that money up front, like just because they've made it rezoned to whatever. There's so so the economics of it is somebody pays. If mm -hmm. the government wants the windfall, so whereas the developer might have said, look, we've made so much out of the land, um, we can give a little bit back and make the land a bit cheaper because we've got now it's like no. Nope. So ultimately, you and I pay. And if you're talking about affordable housing and cheap land, this is a classic example of market forces at work where, you know, if the cost goes up, it's got to be paid on. So, so I get, I, I see an argument where, yep, we could certainly take a little bit off the table, 50% tax. All right. Um, so we'll see how that economic works. So I think you're going to see the industry um, play hardball on that um, in terms of whether it will yield the, the revenues that the state government looks at. So well, it plays into the point that you made, Ben, that it's 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 largely about fixing a black hole rather, because it's 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 solving a short-term problem which is creating a it's just kicking the can down the road for problems yep. that will exist to the uh, to the to the taxpayer yep. who's ultimately trying to get access to this land. They'll pay more because there's less supply or they'll they'll get it in hidden costs from the developer trying to recoup it. So um, interesting. Victoria. Yep. State budget today. Stay tuned. A big, yeah, big cross on that one. <laughs> um, all right, Q and A, Bryce. Let's get into some fun stuff. All right, that's the boring stuff out of the way, but it's yeah. boring but important. 
Um, and you all need to know that. And I think, you know, you can sit there at the pub or you can uh, have a chat around the dinner table or whatever. I think it's you, you need to take an interest in the politics because at the end of the day, these people set the rules for us. Um, so I think it is important. But I, but I also say that don't trust the system. Just go about and just basically make yourself self-funded self retiree. Lifestyle design that you um, create from your own self-funding. Correct. Forget about you know others who can control it. You've got the levers on your own destiny, people. Mm. So mm. if you keep showing up and doing what you're doing, mm. I promise you, you won't have to worry about most of this stuff. But just expect that the government's going to take more, more off you over time. There you go. Thanks for firing up, Ben. All right, Ben, as you said, we're going to uh, do a little bit of Q&A just to give a little contrast to the budget news. And I've got this question that's come in from the, the Property Couch Facebook Messenger. Uh, it's from Al Knight Lewis. And the topic is investment stock and investment grade. Question, is it still relevant? Good afternoon. I've just started listening to your podcast and I'm finding them so interesting. Episode eight talks about investment stock versus investment grade. And I'm wondering if the info in this episode is still current and relevant six years later. I'm looking for our first investment in Brisbane. So just to build up some context, Ben, back in April of 2015, you and I <laughs> recorded the investment grade versus investment stock, which is part of the vernacular now, I reckon. There's a, there's a, it's really embedded in the industry. There's a lot of, there's a lot of our peers who um, we're very, we're very um, grateful and thankful that they listen to our podcast and incorporate it into their into their dialogues that they're having yep. with their own clients within their Agreed. own businesses. But um, investment stock versus investment grade wasn't that well known back then in 2015. So we spent a bit of time differentiating between the two. And so the good news is that, well, I, I cannot remember what we said. I'll be totally honest, Ben. But but what I do know is the, the, um, the principles that we talk about at a framework level are always um, 90, well, let's throw a number, 98.3% uh, <laughs> evergreen, Ben. They are evergreen principles because we rarely talk about topics that are um, fad or... Um, Johnny on the spot or um, not timeless principles. So the idea of there being investment grade and there being investment um, stock is still as relevant today as it ever was and will still be more, uh, will still be relevant going into the future. So the good news that we can give Al Knight Lewis and for everyone who's listening who might be in a similar journey where they've just started with us, um, yes, the timeless evergreen principles that we talked about uh, back in April 2015 still do exist. So like I said, I can't remember what we said, Ben, but I do feel 100% confident that the the actual framework that we talked about um, is well and truly um, relevant today. So I just want to qualify that. I'm not dismissing that. I, I hope I said the right thing. I just can't remember word for word what we said, but I do know yeah. that the framework is absolutely still relevant. Yep, supply is the enemy of capital growth. Um, investment grade versus investment stock moves on the principle that investment stock is built on mass, mass volumes of that um, homogenous stock. So there's no point of difference. There's no relevance to it. And our argument around investment grade is that combination of land, well-located land, because at the end of the day, it's the land that appreciates. And But you can also get... Um, some uh, improvements on that land that have high desirability, high emotional content, and that rings true anywhere. Now, what we are seeing with low interest rates um, is that it means that the rising tide is again lifting all ships. So the argument's going to be is who gets the long-term uh, income growth, and that will revert back to even some of those more important areas that I believe will still continue to outperform based on um, the desirability and the demand for those areas as opposed to the investment stock. So it's been proven there's some data that's floating around now around um, what what performs better. Old houses perform better than any other um, any other uh, compounding return over a long period of analysis. And the most uh, underperforming asset has been medium and high density apartment stock. So it's true to form and we think that will continue. Two things. There's a paradox paradoxical thing, a paradoxical um, concept of investment stock is not good for investors. So mm -hmm. let that land. It's paradoxical. You think, hang on a second. You just said it's investment stock is not good for investors. That's right. Because as, an, as, a, as a, an experienced 
uh, investor you want to chase stock that owner occupiers like. We have documented that multiple times on this podcast. So circle back to that if you need to. So that's number one. Uh, and number two, I've just had a text message go off on my uh, phone. So it's distracted me. I'm trying to remember what my second point was, Ben, um, around investment stock versus investment grade. So it will come back to me. But the important thing is um, it is still relevant, but it's paradoxical that yeah. you're not chasing that investor stock. Oh, here's the second point. Um, where, where, it, um, where it has a slight difference is in the inner Sydney market because a bit of that medium density stock is actually performed quite well for a lot of people. I've had a lot of Sydney folks go, hang on a second. Well, that city is probably the only city that actually has a little bit of a, um, a higher performance on someone that's because it's got such huge population. Mm. The geography in Sydney is barriered by a national park to the south. They've got a mountain range to the side. They've got um, ocean and then they've got all these waterways. It just makes it so geographically tough. that So therefore, it's such a higher density city. But I still wouldn't be loose in Sydney. I'd still go back to the fundamentals of yeah. making sure that if you are going to buy in a block, um, proven performing block, um, not the massive high rises that are under enormous stress, um, both from a PR perspective, from an engineering perspective, from a body corporate perspective. So, so medium density stock works a bit better in that city. Mm. Um, but I still would ignore the fundamentals that we talked about at your peril in that city. Yeah, in Sydney's case, you get these um, mega design in de density areas, Parramatta, the CBD, Willow Creek, and where there's just literally thousands that are going to be built over a period of time and they're all relatively homogenous, um, they underperform. So, so I think the context there that Bryce is saying is those 20 to 30 um, older blocks and, and the density there, they've actually delivered capital growth and our clients are also pretty happy about the ones that we bought for them during the times that we bought them there. So, but I'm also talking about medium. I'm not talking about high density. I'm talking about medium yeah. density where you've just got slightly bigger apartment blocks that yeah. are, that do have some of the facilities. They've actually done they've actually done okay because Sydney's been through yeah. a boom since we we went through that episode and then obviously you've had this post COVID. So that could be a little confusing for some of the Sydney folk, but yeah, I'd still, agreed. I'd still, I'd still dive super deep in the principles that we talked about. So that if you are going to buy medium density, uh, low to medium density in that city, notice I didn't say medium to high density, yeah. low to medium density in that city that you're still um, leaning in on the fundamentals. Did that awesome. help? Al, let us know, um, go back to us on social, send us an email, let us know. We'd love to know. Um, if that was helpful. And it's obviously a good one to revisit for our community. This next one is from the Property Couch Facebook comment on one of our posts, Ben, Don Holloway. Are there any benefits from having 10K sitting in an offset account? With interest rates so low at the moment, is there any benefits from having 10K sitting in an offset? My calculations in brackets and confirmed by investment bankers and mortgage brokers, close brackets, it's best to buy quality shares with your 10K than to uh, to month ball it into an offset. Mm. Month ball it into an offset. Moth I'd love to hear it. your thoughts on this. By the Moth way, I've read your book. Is, yeah, moth ball. I think moth ball. Yeah, 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 that's what God. he's trying to do. No, it's all right. It's just a typo. It says month ball there. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on this. By the way, I've read your book last year. Found it to be parallel to Scott Pape, Barefoot Investor. So uh, two things on that. One, I'll get you to comment, uh, Ben, on the offset in just a second. But two, um, with that reference to Scott barefoot investor uh, if you go back to episode 237 uh, we actually it's a topic uh, it's an episode called barefoot investor or money smarts what's the difference we go into that into some detail um, so feel free to circle back to that on why there is a very subtle but very significant difference between money smarts and barefoot we'll touch on it in just a sec with ben's answer but um episode 237 is supporting to our response ben should we put 10k into offset or should we go and throw it into the stock market? Bryce, Bryce, many, many years ago, probably going back almost 20 odd years ago now, um, I had a line of credit with $120,000 facility there, Bryce. And I'm thinking, okay, well, I've got some money in the offset and I'm going to buy another property. I know I've got my plans for my property, but that's, yeah, what a, ooh, that, that's, I could make some money out of that. So I went to see a financial planner before we'd set the business up and I asked him the question, hey, I got this money that I can pay 5.2% interest on. And I'm looking at some shares and some managed funds and some properties that are 
yielding and returning of around 8%. So on the arbitrage, I can make a couple of percent. What do you reckon I should do? Um, Because I'm thinking this is a great idea. Mm. I'll I'll just make some more money. Um, Well, obviously the wise owl, um, Mm. because he'd been around for a long time, Martin McGrath was his name, um, that he just sort of said, well, on paper, Ben, you're absolutely right. Um, and potentially it could be a good use of that money. But I, but then you've got to pay capital gains tax if you've got to get it out quickly. Um, and ultimately, if the government's going to take, you know, a third of that or more um, away, um, it's a high risk for a short amount of return if you're going to deploy that money somewhere else in, the, the, you know, the short to medium term. So we've always been conservative about how we want to give advice. And, and it worries me that there's mortgage brokers out there who are, dabbling in financial advice for one, um, that's not their um, wheelhouse. They should not be giving you financial advice around that, even investment bankers. Who well, investment bankers take more risk by nature, right? <laughs> yeah, they do. So so the, the point being is, yes, you could. But I mean, what's a good example? You might think that BHP is a blue chip share, but you know, China only yesterday announced that they're potentially going to you know, mine their own iron ore. Um, mm. And so the share price dropped 4%. Now, so there's no such thing as a guaranteed return. And, and I think that's, that's important for people to understand that there are risk rewards with those types of strategies. So yes, is your money lazy in offset? At the moment it is, all right? But I also say you wanna be relatively confident um, that you can get a better return. And if you can, whether it be in a bond and it's an, an annuity and or a guaranteed you know, return, even bonds can potentially still have some risk attached to them. So I think it's best to work out what your strategy is there because you only need to go back to um, March last year and look at global share markets and see what happens um, when there's a shock, uh, when there's a black swan event, um, how risky is that money? So if you're saying I could... I could, you know, still survive without that 10 grand um, and I want that money to be working harder for me, go and talk to your financial planner or yeah. um, take a calculated risk assessment on whether you do that. Our view is for small amounts of money, no, but if you've got 100 grand or 200 grand to get an offset, um, then there might be an opportunity to see whether that money could work a little bit for you. But I would want to know the pros and cons of that in detail because, it's not a guarantee. There are always risks. It's a volatility spectrum discussion, isn't it? Where yep. do you sit on the volatility spectrum? I mean, if you're getting a return, you actually are getting a return. It's just disguised mm. when you're in the offset account because if you're paying 3% on your mortgage, you're actually getting the equivalent of a 3% return, which is actually better than a 3% return because it's not income. Mm. It's actually a reduced expense. So a dollar saved is a dollar earned. So so it just so it's linear. It's, it's, it's almost, well, it's effectively guaranteed. Like mm. if you keep it in there, it's going to get this linear return yep. versus where you sit on the volatility spectrum. Because um, yeah, you, you, you could make more money outside, but you could lose it as well. So if yep. you don't like volatility, put it in the offset. If you love volatility, you eat it for breakfast, go and play, go and play in the share. So, so the, uh, the important point, there's no, there's no answer to that. No, case by case. Case by case. Yeah, absolutely. But um we are very strong advocates of parking cash in offset. Um, ben opened with uh, his uh, conservative advice. So that will remain. That will remain, Ben, if you go back to um, our episode number eight around investment grade investment stock. Is it an evergreen principle? Yep. And if you come back to our podcast in 200 episodes time and refer back to this one, we'll still have the same. We'll be conservative and we'll, we'll take the, um, uh, the conservative route. So good question, Don. Thank you for that. Um, and just a reminder, if you want to, uh, the offset is is a very massive clue in the difference between um, Barefoot and us. Mm. So circle back to episode 237. Um, Stiggy will put a little link in the show notes to make it super simple for you to find it um, and go and listen to where we think the difference is between. But thanks for thanks for uh, reading our book. For those of you who haven't read, I'm assuming you're referring to Make Money Simple Again because that's the direct comparison to Barefoot. Um, but irrespective, if you don't have a copy of our book, Ben, you can get a free copy of Make Money Simple Again by going to makemoneysimpleagain.com.au um, where you'll get a digital version. And if you want a physical version of our first book, The Armchair Guide to Property Investing, go to thearmchairguide.com.au. We will send you a book for free 
if you tell us where to send it and pay for the postage. So uh, go and check that out. Mate, we've covered a fair bit. We've gone we through have. the wrap of the budget nationally. We've gone through a little bit of you um, getting fired up about Victoria. You've, we've opened the episode with you getting very defensive about your beloved Collingwood as well. So that was a nice little start. <laughs> and uh, went we on me rant. <laughs> yep. And we uh, and and then obviously we've covered some questions. So I just want to encourage folks that we hear you. You can go to Speakpipe. You can do it on our socials. Send us an email. We are building up a database of these questions, and we are happy to um, riff through them. In upcoming months but uh my life hack today ben is um i'm gonna do another quote it's from mitch kapor getting information from the internet is like taking a drink from a fire hydrant right so mitch kapor for those those old enough uh, us old fossils ben mitch kapor um there was used before um when it when computers first started there was that lotus smart suite do you remember that as an alternative to the microsoft mm-hmm. suite there was one two lotus one two three which was an original spreadsheet and there was lotus notes which was the alternative to word so the millennials are just going what are you talking about <laughs> right but for us back in the uh the bg days before google days this is what it looked like but um I just wanted to use that um, comment as a hack to remind people that if you're getting information from the information age, it's it's actually it's actually going to be overwhelming. So curation is actually the key now. Curation of information is more important than information because there is so much stuff out there. Even when you think about when we started our podcast, Ben, some six years ago, we weren't the first, but we were one of the pioneers. Right now, there's over a million podcast just on itunes alone before we go into spotify and all the other ways stitcher and everything that you can listen to your podcast right so so the amount of information out there is just overwhelming so curation is the key so you you're about to sign off by saying knowledge is empowering but only if you act on it but i reckon equally only if you're acting on the right stuff right which goes back to my original mindset minute today of if you're going in the wrong direction doesn't matter how fast you're going so so this is why we've tried to build a community of people who who trust your ability, Ben, and my ability and and our team's ability to curate information that is relevant for our message. So episode eight, investment stock versus investment grade, we get people on to our podcast who reinforce that fundamental belief that you and I have about what types of properties to get on. So you'll notice that we never get developers on our podcast to talk about their views on property because it's fundamentally differs from a fundamental principle that you and I have. Now, if you're interested in that, you have to go to another podcast because we're never going to bring them on, right? Mm-hmm. So, so, so what I, what I, my life hack today is just to, just to really be, be um, conscious of who you can trust that will curate information for you. Um, because if you just, if you, if you go to the internet, you'll be like drinking from a fire hydrant. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Tim Ferriss is one for me, Ben. I trust that Tim Ferriss is going to get a guest on his podcast who is going to give me an opportunity to to fast track optimal habits for maximum outcome. That's his thing, right? So he goes and curates those people, gets mm. them on. Best in so the I world. can actually, yep, I can actually trust at, at at ground zero that if I do invest the time to listen to him, that it's going to be fundamentally in line with a curation um, approach that he takes. Another one is Denzel Washington. Um, This is highly um, subjective, but I've never personally watched a Denzel Washington movie that I've been disappointed about because I reckon he chooses scripts really well and he he chooses movies. And I've always thoroughly enjoyed Denzel Washington movies. So therefore, I know that if he puts out a new movie when we get movies being released on Mock again, if he's in it, I'll just go and watch it just because he's in it. Because he's actually curated all of all the choices that I can make, I can actually go and trust that he's now not to say that he's never going to let me down, but mm. just to say that the track rock would suggest that he's a good curator of good scripts that I actually want to go. Joe Witten, um, she's got a movement called Quirky Cooking, right? Now Joe Witten is someone that I trust that if I need to go and find a recipe that's tasty, that's in my world where it's gluten free, dairy free largely refined sugar free i know that i can go to her world and i know that she curates the best stuff to punch out so so these are the things that i'm 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 wanting to encourage um based on that statement of getting information from the internet is like taking a drink from the fire hydrant my life hack today is make sure that you are spending a fair bit of time just doubling down on who you are going to curate your information from ben and i would love and in fact if you are listening to this podcast you've already probably trusted that 
that we're doing that for you. But just know that um, I get, Ben, I'm, I'm the gatekeeper of all requests that come onto this podcast. And I can assure you there's a lot. <laughs> and <laughs> and, I'm, and, I'm, and I, I go to an extraordinary length to make sure that the people who come onto this podcast fit within the curated content that we want. Climb the mountain $2,000 passive income per week without it being um, risky, whilst being conservative, that um, doesn't mean that you have to have a zillion properties in, a, in five minutes. Um, so, and I make no apology for that. I'm, I'm, I'm deliberately, and obviously you, but mm-hmm. we are deliberately curating information on our podcast to guide people to the summit of where we've been very clear on where we want them to be. So I know I got a little bit... Um, uh, sort that of, was your uh, that was your rant. It was good. My rant, but it's it. it's important. To, it's important <laughs> totally. that we've got a lot of opportunities to invest our time now. Yeah, our earbuds, our eyeballs, our everything, and so we've got to be to have a deliberate um, intention to curate from the right people. Mate, what's making property news? Well, I think we've we've sort of hammered the property news, which was the budget, right? So that's probably the main thing, and I'm conscious of time. Um, if I could just add to what you were saying there, Bryce. The, the algorithms um, that are designed through social media, we've talked about this before, are designed to serve you up the stuff that they think you want to see, right? So if you've got a bias or an interest or something, they're going to keep serving you that stuff up. So that, let's use that as an example where if you wanted to find somewhere on the internet, people talking about the pros of buying high density or off the plan and all that, they'll keep serving you up that content. And you can potentially go down that rabbit warren and think a very well, that's good a good point. argument. That's a very good argument. Um, it's a you know it's a bit like how uh, Facebook serves up information, and we you know we have this this bias that we create and this anchoring that happens when we get to that sunk cost bias. So I still encourage people to look at the world subjectively and with an open mind um, in in some areas that they study, whether it be science, health. Um, climate change is another classic example, right? Um, where people potentially get in rabbit warrens and then all of a sudden their views are a bit skewed. So, so I think that that's right. If you, I like your approach, Bryce, and that Tim's been consistent in serving you up great information. Denzel from a movie point of view and, and Joe from a health and diet and, and food uh, delivery point of view. That's cool, right? Because because then they're, they're your trusted sources. And, and you know, I, I like what you're saying about we, we try our best Um, to deliver content that is relevant to you as you go about your money, finance, and obviously importantly, property journey um, as part of that. So I think, you know, I'll I'll round out my my support of your your life hack. Uh, Very good. Thank you, sir. Um, Yep. What's making money news? We're going to leave that as the episode, right? Uh, What's making property news? So we're going to leave that as the episode. Uh, Well played. So mate, um, just a a little sneak preview to next week. Uh, We got me old mate, um, Ronnie. Veronica Morgan coming on to the podcast. Ah, very good. Um, she'll be chatting about um, uh, something that she's very, very qualified to talk about, and that's auctions in a hot market. So stick around for that, folks. But until next week, Ben. Knowledge is empowering, Bryce, but only if you act on the right stuff. Oh, I like that little variation. <laughs> you do listen to me. See you, see you next week, folks. See you later. Hey there, folks. Bryce Holdaway here. Before you go, if you're new to our community and are only listen to maybe a handful of episodes, I thoroughly recommend that you go all the way back to episode number one, where we unpack all of the foundations when it comes to property investing. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit time poor, I've got good news for you. We have a binge guide that you can download straight away, which summarizes the first 20 episodes where Ben and I unpack the foundational pillars of the A, B, C, D, and so much more. And you can get that straight away. If you go to the property couch, dot com dot au forward slash tpc20 you can download it and consume it whenever you want it's completely free and available now and for those of you just a quick reminder that nothing we've spoken about today constitutes financial advice we recommend that you reach out to your licensed professional advisor so that you can look at your unique circumstances before acting on any information now don't forget, go to thepropertycouch.com.au forward slash TPC20 and get your binge guide today.